So I feel like I've been saying this in the intros of all of my videos for the past month, but this video is going to be a little different than what I usually post on here. Um, I recently, last week, just finished installing a fairly large built-in that I made in the shop. It was in pieces around the shop because my ceilings are not eight foot tall. So I do about a, one built-in a year. That's how long. It usually takes about a year for me to agree to do another one just because of those, those, those issues. Um, it takes longer to do it in a shop like this. But I already have, I believe, two built-in videos on my channel. And while I do like to film, I think the, the last one was almost probably two years old at this point, but um, I still filmed it because what I decided to do with this footage is play the footage of, of building the built-in, kind of overlaid some very basic descriptions of what's going on in most of the frames of the video. So if people want to follow along to the build, they'll be able to get the basic gist of what's going on. The overlay for this will not be step-by-step -step directions on the built-in. It's going to be answering some questions that I get most frequently on, on YouTube. And those, I get a lot of questions about how much I charge um, and, and how I get customers. So um, it's basically going to be answering a lot of those questions, filling in that space with that. Now, this is going to be a two-part series because I do have, I believe, two weeks worth of footage, but also because... It is not uncommon for the day or so after I upload a video to remember something I wish I would have said in the video. So this will just give you the opportunity because I'm sure I'm going to miss something I wanted to say to remember it and then upload it next week. Also, I figured I'd be getting some questions in the comments and then I could um, answer those as well. Now, as a generalized rule of thumb, I do not tell people exactly how much each piece costs. Um, most of what I do is custom work. I used to have a, a pretty general price list on my website. I don't think I have that on there anymore because no one ever looked at it. But for custom pieces, when I'm working with a customer, it's not uncommon for us to be talking to each other for about three months before even building anything. It just feels like a little bit of an invasion of their privacy to put what it cost up there. And I'm not retroactively emailing people asking if I can. The other reason is because I get, as this channel gets more popular um, and my business in general gets more popular, I get a ton of emails, spam emails, asking um, prices for things. And I don't really know what the end game is for that, but I could usually pick up on the fact that they're spam fairly quickly. So I just want to avoid the whole um, monetary issue with, with that. I don't want to get involved with it. However, I will tell you how I come to making up my, my labor prices on top of the material cost. So it's not going to be completely vague. I'm just not going to specifically tell you how much each project cost. Um, other than that, because it's a built-in, it's a very custom piece of furniture that fits perfectly inside the, the homeowner's house. So um, just for people that are following along to the build, it was two, two, two built-ins that flank a fireplace. Um, one was actually a little bit bigger than the other just because of the dimensions of the house. But in general, it was eight feet tall by a little over five foot wide. And the base cabinets were 36 inches tall, which left the top portion at about five feet. So you'll see the two sections I'm making. I made the whole thing out of birch veneer ply. The face frames are three quarter inch poplar. So if I'm cutting a dado, um, it's assumed that it's a three-quarter inch dado. If I'm cutting a rabbit for the backer, used half inch, half inch ply for the backer, it can be assumed that that's a half inch rabbit um, because I'm not going to get too, too in depth with dimensions uh, in the video. So my sort of personal philosophy on woodworking is woodworking is something that anyone with basic tools can make a coffee table as a weekend warrior. But to master the craft, to make an excellent piece of furniture, takes a lifetime work of worth of practice and, and refining that skill. So my prices reflect that. Um, stuff I made five years ago, I don't consider bad pieces of furniture, but the skill set I have now is much more advanced, and I just make a nicer quality piece of furniture. The same thing can be said for things I'll make five years from now. Um, so like, my prices kind of reflect that. They also go up slightly with inflation as well, just like anything else. Something you made 10 years ago is not going to be worth what it is now. 
Um, you could say that about any any goods or services, really. But also because, especially since COVID, stuff like uh, two by fours, two by sixes have almost doubled in price around me. So the stuff like that will affect the price. But the basic labor um, reflects what I think is my skill set and. Things like prices I charge now, I wouldn't have charged five years ago, and prices I charge now are probably not going to be prices I charge five years from now. Also, um, depending on the type of work you have, kind of kind of represents costs for me as well. Um, pieces I don't really feel like doing. I wouldn't necessarily say I overcharge because in general I think my prices are very fair. If anything, they're probably a little under what they're worth. So if I get an email from a customer about something I really don't feel like making, I know it's going to be a pain, I will usually um, have the price reflect that. So if I'm making it, it kind of accounts for the fact I don't really want to make it, I guess is a good way to put it. But when I first started out, um, you're trying, you're making a lot of stuff for friends and family. You're trying to get as much work as possible. Uh, location was really important for me. I live in a pretty bustling town and I'm only about 45 minutes outside of Philly. And when I started, I did have a business partner and they lived in Philly. So I did get work in Philly, which was nice because word of mouth is super important with business. I know everybody's always big on social media and all that, and I do get jobs through social media, but by and large, word of mouth and repeat customers are where most of my customers come from. So the fact that I had a shop on not necessarily a very busy street, but it's in the center of town, people are always driving by. To this day, I still get people that stop by and say, I see you out here working all the time, like what do you do? And I get a lot of work that way, just from being seen. So ge ge uh, geography can play, play a role in that, as well as with pricing. Um, if you live in New York City, you're gonna be charging very different prices than if you live in the middle of nowhere. So there is that as well. But like I was saying, when I first started out, you're doing mostly stuff for friends and family at very good prices. To this day, I still give friends and family a discount. I even give people in town um, a little bit of a discount just because they're choosing to shop locally versus going to to a bigger, bigger store. And um, you're also, at least I did, did a lot of repair work and a lot of refinishing work the first couple years I was in business because no one that I know enjoys doing that sort of work. There are specialists who love it, but in general, most people do, um, do not enjoy refinishing work. The problem with refinishing work, especially for myself, is my shop is so small. So to re be refinish, uh, if I'm making a piece of furniture, I could usually work on a couple things at once and then time it perfectly so I'm doing the finish where it won't get super dusty in my shop. If you're doing refinishing work, it takes up a lot of space. There's usually chemicals involved and it could sometimes really hamper working on other things in the shop. So the nice thing is, is as I've gotten more popular, I've gotten more work, you do get to pick and choose things that you, you want to do and don't do. At this point, for the most part, if someone even emails me about refinishing work, I recommend them to someone else because I don't really do it. I still repair furniture, just not as much as, as I used to for the same reason. I mean, you're only going to charge, at least I am, I'm only going to charge someone so much to repair um, a, their chair. You're not, you, those jobs don't make a ton of money. So if that's all you're doing, it could be really hard to pay your bills um, doing nothing but smaller projects. I do like smaller projects. I call them beer money projects because that's usually like the type of money you're making. But once again, um, you have to do so many, so much more smaller work in order to make up the cost difference of like a built-in per se. Built-ins are one of my largest profit margins. Doing one of those usually makes my month and it doesn't take a whole month to make it. So like I said, I don't do a ton of them just because you'll see in the video, it's a pain. My ceilings are eight feet tall. I don't have a ton of space. So it's usually just a wrestling sort of hassle to get these done. It takes me about six months or so to forget what a pain it was and, and agree to do another one. So like I was also saying, right now word of mouth is, is and repeat customers are probably my biggest, um, and, and mostly local, local customers are the three biggies for me. 
right now alone I'm working on a piece for someone I made a kitchen table for this this summer um, I, the next project I have after that is someone I also made a table for and the project after that is someone I've also made a piece for before those are my my three projects coming up and the three after that are all local local residents who either saw my shop or found me online probably through a Google search and and reached out to me so I do get work I have gotten jobs off of YouTube Instagram Facebook all of those sorts of places but by and large um, like I said word of mouth and and local residents is where all of that comes from I used to sell a lot more on Etsy when I first started out but I personally find Etsy to be um, a little bit of a pain I've never had a problem with any local customers. I don't make anyone sign contracts. I don't make anyone give me down deposits. I've been told before I'm going to get burned and I don't necessarily disagree with that. But as soon as I start writing up contracts, it, it ruins the whole interaction for me. I've been doing it for years and I haven't had a problem with it. I know other people that have been doing it for a lifetime and haven't had a problem with it. Um, but as soon as you start selling stuff online and as soon as the person isn't your neighbor is when they become a pain. Um, they start complaining about things that aren't wrong. I think a lot of times people change their minds and then want to return it even though it's a custom piece of furniture. So after a year or two of, of, of heading and shipping is also a huge issue with these bigger pieces um, and them coming broken and then it's really your problem not, not, the, not the buyer's problem. So I've steered away from places like Etsy before, but I used to make a, a decent amount of money on those sorts of, of outlets. But basically what happens is I'll usually get an email. They'll tell me they saw my shop. Um, the bear outside my shop attracts a lot of people and they want something made. Um, sometimes people will just say they want a table and then usually I have to tell them I need more information. But let's use the table as an example. They'll give me some dimensions nine times out of ten someone has a picture of what they want nine times out of ten I could find that photo online now if it's something from an outlet like Wayfair for example it's going to be a very inexpensive piece of furniture and that doesn't really help me but a lot of times it's furniture from pretty expensive outlets even Pottery Barn their furniture is not super cheap and I do use that figure in calculating price assuming the person saw that piece of furniture and already saw that price if you severely undercharge you're hurting yourself if you severely overcharge you're not really being fair to the customer so that does help a lot with with costs especially in the beginning because you don't really know how long it takes to make something the problem with my business is since everything's so custom um, I'm not making the same thing twice so I've definitely run into the problem of thinking a piece is going to be really easy to make I write up the estimate and all of that and it really isn't it's a pain in the butt I don't change my estimates for customers if I underestimate the labor. Um, I've gotten into arguments with people about that. It's a personal preference. I keep the estimate. Unless the customer changes something, like they want a drawer and I need to buy more hardware and it costs more money, but in general, if I mess up an estimate, I just take the hit. So. I'll send them the estimate. Um, a lot of times, if you're getting into this, this business, a lot of times people will not even email you back, which is super frustrating. But at this point, I have a healthy list of clients. I have worked through, I believe, June at this point, and I get multiple emails a week from people asking, um, asking me to make them pieces. But that is basically where the labor cost comes from, is I will look at something, I'll, I'll calculate out the materials, that's easy to do with built-ins, you know, you're just calculating how much plywood you need. But as far as the labor, it's a couple factors. It's if the piece of furniture is online, what are what is someone else charging for it? Finding prices on Etsy is great because to me that's a fair market value. That's what people that are also making furniture are charging. You'll notice there are people on Etsy who severely undercharge and overcharge, but you could find a kind of a nice rhythm in the middle. And that's usually how I get the labor charge. If it's something I've made before, it's really easy. I already know what I charge and I know if it was too much or too little. Um, I don't overcharge just to overcharge.
And then, like I said, from those initial emails, um, usually what I do is I write up an estimate pretty quickly because if the person doesn't want to do it, that's usually when you scare them off. It could be multiple factors. It's more than they thought it was going to be, or they decide to get something else. I'll have find, a lot of people will email me back and they say they went to um, some sort of secondhand furniture store and found what they wanted. And now that I have such a long waiting list, I do get people that say they don't wanna wait so long, which is totally understandable. But like I said, if you're starting out in a business, you're gonna be surprised at how many people ghost you, which can be frustrating because estimates can be very time consuming to write up, especially on bigger pieces of furniture. It also takes a lot of time to decide how to build something. If someone's sending you a photo from Pinterest or Wayfair or something like that, I tell them, yeah, I can make this, but I'm not going to make it the way they made it in the photo because it's just not a good design. So that takes a lot of time, figuring out the best way to do something. So it can be frustrating when people don't get back to you. And I've had family members tell me I should charge for estimates, but I'm not going to do that. I just don't think you'll ever get a lot of work if you're, if you're charging for estimates personally. And then, like I said in the beginning of the video, I will talk to people usually for, sometimes I've talked to customers for about six months before. Um, if you're taking the time to find a, a local craftsperson and spending, because this is going to cost more money than going to a place like Wayfair, and I'm not knocking Wayfair, it's just an example I get a lot. Um, I like to make sure that they're getting exactly what they, what they want and it's built exactly, uh, and it's built as strong and will last as long as possible. So that interaction with the person is, is worth it to, to me at least. So I don't mind emailing with people. I'd rather get it right than them get it and, and not like it. But then once that happens, like I said, that could go on for a while, the emailing back and forth, finalizing the piece. Most of these are custom, so even if someone's sending me a photo, that doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly how it's going to look. We tweak and fine-tune things until we get uh, the final piece, and then obviously you see the, the results of that, which is, which is these build videos. But for example, like built-ins, I've done enough of these and they're usually roughly around the same size. I know exactly what I could tell them what the estimate is. I give them a rough number and then I'll say, if, if you decide to move forward with this, I could write you up a detailed estimate and we could, we could continue talking. The nice thing is usually at that point, the person doesn't ghost you because after that, writing up a really detailed estimate and someone disappearing is when things really start to stink. But for built-ins, the way I got my original labor cost with built-ins, which I still use today, was I googled how much does a built-in cost. And there was a website that kind of gave rough prices of everything, and I went from there. Um, it was an average price based on the, the median of the country, and I kind of have tweaked it down the line, but that is a lot of how I get my pricing. Tables, same thing, basic tables, I've made enough of them, I know how much I want to charge. So this is the finished built-in, and this is a perfect example. This is pretty basic, there's not a lot of bells or whistles to it. So that original website I found some uh, five or four years ago had the that average price of about four grand, and that that's usually the number I start with and work off of for something like this.